day had finally arrived. It's a big tent on the outskirts of town. It had been advertising for weeks and weeks. The tent was filling with people anxiously anticipating the miracles that were promised at the great revival coming to town. It was almost time for the evangelist to take the stage and begin the service when an elderly gentleman sitting down front stood up and began to deliver a message in tongues. He sat down and everyone said, Amen, praise the Lord. Another elderly gentleman towards the rear of the auditorium stood up and he said, I'm a Jew and I know Hebrew and that man spoke perfect Hebrew. And the man stood in front and he said, I don't know Hebrew. And everyone said, praise God, we've heard a miracle. Until the gentleman in the back said, that man cursed the name of God in Hebrew. And the big tent went silent. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Tongues is the most popular of the gifts of the Spirit, but I believe in spite of being the most popular, it's the least understood of all the gifts. Have you ever been asked the question, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking in tongues? And the implication is that if you haven't spoken in tongues, then you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I always like to ask the question, why do you believe that tongues is always the evidence for baptism of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is always the same. They say because every place in the Bible where the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out, they always gave evidence by speaking in tongues. Well, we're going to see that that's not accurate. But we're going to do more than that because I believe the failure to understand the purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit results in a misunderstanding of the gifts. What is the purpose for the baptism of the Spirit? Jesus himself said, among his last words to the disciples before he ascended to heaven, the last words recorded by Luke in the book of Acts, because Luke wrote the book of Acts, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus' promise to his church was that you will receive power. And the purpose for this power is to enable God's church to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jerusalem at home, with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family, Judea, a wider area, Samaria, even the hated Samaritans were to receive the gospel, and then, even worse, to the far corners of the earth, the lowly Gentile. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to preach the gospel to every tribe, language, nation, and people on the globe. That's why Jesus said, I will give you the Holy Spirit. And the separ if we separate the purpose of the gifts from the gifts themselves, then we're going to have confusion about the use and function of the gifts. And that's exactly what I think happens. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Paul reiterates the same thing. In chapter 4, verse 7, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ 
apportions it. Notice it's Christ who makes the decisions as to how grace is being given. Jesus is the one who decides. He goes on to say in verse 8, when he, that's Christ, ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. So Christ apportions the outpouring of the Spirit and the gifts. Who decides which gifts men should have? It's Christ who makes that decision. Verse 11 tells us he gave some to be apostles. Just some, not all. He gave some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, not all, but some. He gave some to be pastors and teachers in order to, and here we ask, why did he pour out these gifts? In order to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, there are two important points here. The purpose of the gifts are to prepare God's people, to equip us for works of service. Why? In order to build up the body of Christ. That's his church. So Jesus decides who should have which gift, and the Spirit, through the gifts, prepares us for works of service in order to build up the church or, as Jesus had said, spread the gospel to the world. Never, ever lose sight of the fact that the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit is to preach the gospel to the world and build up the church of Jesus Christ. That's the measuring stick that's the yardstick for measuring the gifts of the Spirit and how to be used. Various gifts to build up the body of Christ, that is, the church. How long will these gifts function in the church? Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Has anyone done that yet? Anyone? <laughs> I don't see any hands going up. The only one is Jesus. The gifts are going to be present in the church until we are mature, until we are fully reflecting Christ. Folks, that's not going to happen until the end. That means that the gifts of the Spirit are to be working in the church all the way through until the end. All of the gifts of the Spirit. All the way through until the end. So let's take a look at the gifts. And I want to do that by focusing on the most popular one, and that is the gift of tongues. But let's see how it fits in the process of preaching the gospel to the world because that's the purpose and the function of the gifts to build up the church which is the body of Christ on the day of Pentecost Acts chapter 2 verse 1 on the day of Pentecost they were all together in one place suddenly verse 2 a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven filled the whole house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. Now, I would like to have been there in that room at that time, wouldn't you? <laughs> to be sitting there to hear this loud sound and to see tongues of fire coming down from heaven and separating and going on each one of them, enabling them to speak in tongues. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it definitely did give evidence by speaking in tongues, no doubt about it, on the day of Pentecost. But there are some things that we need to notice. First of all, when the Bible says they began to speak in other tongues, the Greek word for tongues is lengua, which means equally languages. 
they could have translated this verse, they all began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, why did God enable them to speak in other languages when he baptized them with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Why did God enable them? Well, I want to show you why. It's clear in the text. But I want to show you something else first. Kind of a side thing. So I'll just throw it in for free. All right. Those tongues of fire. That was always a curious thing to me. Tongues of fire came down and enabled and empowered them, and they spoke in other languages or tongues. So why did God enable them to speak in other languages when they were baptized by the Holy Spirit? The answer is found in the next verse, verse 5, Acts chapter 2. Now there was staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under earth. So people from virtually every nation and language were present there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Did you catch that? God enabled them to speak in other languages by the power of the Spirit, and people from all over the world were assembled together in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and God used this unique opportunity to enable them to speak, and those hearing them heard them speaking in their own languages. That would be like if some of you were Japanese and some of you Chinese and some of you Italian and some of you Spanish and some of you Portuguese and some French and any other language on earth while I am speaking. You would be hearing me in French, in Spanish, in Japanese, in Hebrew or whatever language you know. That's what happened at Pentecost. They asked each other, amazed, in verse 7, all these men Galileans, how is it that each one of us hears them speaking in his own native language? And he lists all the languages there. We hear them again at the end of verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Now that was a miracle, wasn't it? They were all together. They all heard. They all understood in their own language. And so Peter preaches a sermon. Everybody's understanding it. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And his sermon is about Jesus Christ and how he was raised from the dead in verse 32. That's about all they like to preach about in those days, about Jesus. He was raised from the dead. It was a gospel sermon. After the sermon, they came to Peter and the other apostles and said, Brothers, what shall we do? I mean, they were stricken. They were convicted in their hearts. What shall we do? We need to do something. What? And Peter replied, I love this, verse 38. There was nothing timid about Peter. He was empowered by the Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Peter expected every single person who heard him preach to repent and to be baptized. <laughs> Now that's positive expectation, isn't it? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And watch this. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So follow me. Repent. Be baptized. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's a promise, isn't it? Verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people were added to the church in one day. Amen. Is that considered building up the body of Christ? Absolutely. You see, that is the real evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
3,000 were baptized in one day. I would love to have that kind of power. Amen. That's the evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. They did repent. They were baptized. Did they receive the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. He promised them they would. Did they give evidence by speaking in tongues? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't say they did. They might have, may not have, doesn't say, so we don't know. Therefore, we cannot say every place in the Bible where they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they always gave evidence by speaking in tongues. The disciples did at Pentecost, but the 3,000, it doesn't say. So we can't say that it's always the evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, why did God do this? He did it in order to preach the gospel to those men who could understand in their own language, to those people, and they could go back to their own countries and share the gospel of Jesus Christ so that not just 3,000 would be added to their number, but thousands upon thousands to the far corners of the earth would be added to their number as a result of the gift of tongues. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Spirit. Then in chapter 4, verse 31, they met together, the disciples, and after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. I mean, it's interesting. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit again. Now, I'd like to have been in that room, <laughs> wouldn't you? I mean, that would have been like an earthquake. The room was shaking. The Spirit was so powerful, the room shook. They were baptized by the Spirit, but it doesn't say they spoke in tongues. It says they spoke the Word of God boldly. And I pray every day, God, empower me to speak your Word boldly. And that can only happen through the baptism of the Spirit. So speaking in tongues isn't always the evidence. It can be. The evidence, though, is the building up of the body of Christ. To preach the Word of God boldly is certainly going to build up the body of Christ. That's the evidence for the baptism of the Spirit. So three times now, two on the day at Pentecost, one time they did give evidence by speaking in tongues, one time it doesn't say, and this time they didn't. They spoke the Word of God boldly. The second point is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time thing. It didn't just happen that one day and then go on with life. No, it's a continuing, ongoing experience. It happens more than once. It happens continually. The purpose of the baptism is to build up the body of Christ, to facilitate us to be able to preach and teach about Jesus. The more you know about God and Jesus, the more power God gives us to testify about Him. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Never, and get this, never does the Bible ever talk about the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in order to build up the individual, the person. It's not there to strengthen us. It's there to empower us to preach the gospel to the world and build up the church. You see, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit builds up the individual. It builds up the person. The baptism of the Spirit is to build up the church. Here's another example in Acts, the 10th chapter. In Acts, chapter 10, Peter had just seen his vision of the sheep full of all kind of unclean animals and unclean things. And the Bible tells us that Peter understood that vision to mean that he should not call any man common or unclean. God was using that vision to blap Peter on the side of the head with a two-by-four because Peter had a hard time accepting Gentiles into the church. He was like the rest of the Jews. He didn't want to do it. 
So oh. God used that vision. It got Peter's attention. He went to visit some Gentiles in the home of Cornelius, who was a centurion in the Roman army, an officer in the Roman army. He preached a gospel sermon while he was there, again in verse 40 of chapter 10, talking about God raising him from the dead on the third day. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He preached a gospel sermon to the Gentiles. In verse 44, while Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit, came on all who heard the message, and the circumcised believers, those Jews that had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentiles. So while Peter was preaching, the Gentiles got the Holy Spirit. Uncircumcised, non-Jewish men got the Holy Spirit. How did they know they got the Holy Spirit? Verse 46 says, because they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Now, why did God do that? Why did God baptize Gentiles with the Holy Spirit and give evidence by speaking in tongues? Because he had a lesson that he wanted to teach his church. Peter got it. Peter said in the next verse, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. You see, Peter understood that as God's sign for these unbelievers that he was to accept them into the church just as he would a Jew. You should say amen to that. Amen. Okay. So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. This was a remarkable thing. God used the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues to move the expansion of the church from Jews all the way out to accepting Gentiles in the church. That's exactly what Jesus said was supposed to happen. Go and baptize them, he said. And he said that you be empowered to preach the gospel. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. That's the Gentiles. And it was the baptism of the Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues, that paved the way for the Gentiles to come into the church. That's why God used the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Two times now he gave evidence by speaking in tongues. Two times he did not. We find one more example of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's found in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, Paul goes to Ephesus, and there he found in verse 2 some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No. We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, What baptism did you receive? John's baptism. John's baptism, he said, was a baptism of repentance. Then he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hand on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So here again, we discover God using the baptism of the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues. Six times. Three times it doesn't say they spoke in tongues. Three times it says they did. God used tongues as evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why did God have them speak in tongues at Ephesus? Because Ephesus was a city on a major trade route at the crossroads of two major trade routes. And thousands of people would pass through Ephesus. There was the church empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues, other languages, to the people coming through so that the body of Christ could be built up. So you see, the purpose of the gifts are always to build up the body of Christ. And that's how the Bible always uses them. Now, I'm going to surprise you. We have just seen three examples 
of the baptism of the Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking in tongues. There were five times when the Bible specifically mentioned the baptism of the Spirit. Two times they did not give evidence by speaking in tongues. Three times they did. These are the only three examples, just three, of God using the gift of tongues as an evidence for the baptism of the Spirit. Just three times in the whole New Testament. That's all. And that's not very many compared to the emphasis that many give to speaking in tongues today. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, well, Pastor, God used tongues at another place, too. The church in Corinth, they did a lot of speaking in tongues. It's true, they did. But let's take a closer look at what happened in the church at Corinth. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First of all, we want to take a look at what the church in Corinth was really like. What kind of a church was it? Was it a model church for us? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready for it. You're still worldly. Now, was that a model church? <laughs> was Corinth the kind of church we want to pattern our church after? They were worldly. He says, I can't address you as spiritual. But you know, it's interesting because he's going to show us as we read further on that the church in Corinth was involved in all kinds of spiritual activity. Yet he says, you're not spiritual, you're worldly. So what's going on there? Let me show you something else, a secret about the church in Corinth. Verse 11. Uh, chapter 11, verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you because your meetings do more harm than good. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? A church whose meetings do more harm than good? In the first place, I hear when you come together, there are divisions among you, and I'm going to show you that the divisions were over the spiritual gifts themselves and the baptism of the Spirit. Corinth was a divided church. It was so divided that when they came together for a church meeting, their meetings did more harm than good. Is that the kind of church we want to pattern our church after? Is this a model church? Do you want to know what their meetings look like? Do you? Well, I'll show you. Chapter 14, hold your place. Chapter 14 what shall we say? Verse 26. When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone is to speak in a tongue, two at the most, three should speak one at a time. So what was going on? They were all in their singing and teaching and preaching and speaking in tongues all at the same time. And Paul says, whoa, your meetings do more harm than good. They divide the church. I don't know, maybe the ones prophesying and the ones in tongues were kind of in a contest. Whoever could do it the loudest would be the best or something. I don't know. But whatever was going on, they were dividing the church and all of this was over the spiritual gifts. So we need to be careful, and here's the point that I'm trying to make in belaboring all of this. We need to be careful that we don't pattern ourselves today after what was happening in Corinth. Are you following me? And we need to be careful that we understand what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. By that I mean whenever Paul says something to the church in Corinth, we should ask ourselves an important question. Is Paul describing a problem 
that was going on there? Or is he prescribing a solution to a problem? You follow the difference? Whenever we read what Paul says to Corinth, ask yourself, is he describing the problem or is he prescribing a solution? If he's describing the problem and we say, that's what we need to do, then we would be taking the same problems of Corinth and bringing them into our own lives and our own churches. If he's describing the solution, then we should say, that's what we need to do. Are you following me? That's important because we need to understand how to interpret what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. Now another thing about Paul, when he writes to a church, usually he gives them the theological study, a Bible study on the particular topic he's talking about. Then he applies that Bible study in real life. That's what he does here. In chapter 12, he's going to give us a Bible study on the gifts of the Spirit. In chapter 14 and 13, he applies it to the church. Now watch. Chapter 12, verse 1. About spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. So he's going to teach them what the spiritual gifts really mean. See, here's his theology, his Bible study on the gifts. Verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts. Verse 7, now to each person, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. What does the common good mean? For the good of the individual or for the good of the church? So to each one, he says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the good of the church. You see, that's the purpose of the baptism, to build up the church, not the individual for the common good. Then he lists the gifts. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another knowledge, another faith, another healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues and interpreting tongues. Notice he put tongues at the bottom of the list. I think it's because, as we'll see, they were putting it at the top of the list. They were lifting it up above all the other gifts. Watch. These are all the gifts. Verse 11. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. So who decides which gift you should have? He does. Do you decide which gift you should have? Does a pastor decide which gift you should have? Who decides? God does. He decides. The, that's the first time he says that here in this chapter. Verse 12. The body is made up of a unit, one body, a unit, though it is made of many parts. They form one body. All the different parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. So every Christian is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Verse 14, now the body is not made up of one part. What's he trying to tell us here? Pay attention. The body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. So the foot can't say, since I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. That means that you can't say to yourself, since I don't have tongues, I'm not a part of the body. Do you follow what he's doing here? Why not? Verse 18. But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Second time. God decides what gift you should have. I'm glad. I'm not very good at picking out what's good for me. <laughs> I may think I am, but he knows a lot more than I know. I messed up enough. Let's leave it up to him. Amen? Amen. So we're all baptized by the Spirit into the body, but God decides which gift we should get. Then, verse 21, he goes on to say, The eye cannot say, I don't need you. 
Therefore, someone with one gift cannot say that since you don't have my gift, then I don't need you. Someone with tongues cannot say, since you don't speak in tongues, you're not a part of the body. Are you following? <laughs> but the baptism of the Spirit brings us into the body of Christ. And we can't be a part of the body of Christ without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think you see where this is going. Look again, verse 24, middle of the verse, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it, verse 25, so there would be no division in the body. Again, third time, who decides which gift? God does. He gives us all the baptism of the Spirit, and then He decides which gift we should have. The baptism of the Spirit brings us into the body of Christ in order to use the gift that He gives us. And the body consists of many different parts, so the body of Christ consists of many different gifts. And you can't say to yourself, if I don't have one gift, I'm not a part of the body. And no one can say to you, if I don't have one gift, I'm not a part of the body. Because God decides who should have which gift and arranges them the way He wants them to be. He knows best. Sometimes we think we know better. Have you ever wished you had an eye in the back of your head? <laughs> I remember when I was little and I would get in a scary place I wished I had an eye in the back of my head. I'd be going that way and that way and that way and that way. Oh, I wished I had another eye, but if I did, you would have felt sorry for me. <laughs> have you ever done any soldering? I remember working on some of my stuff. I had to solder, and anybody that's ever soldered wished you had more than one hand, more than two hands, right? I mean, you need a hand to hold a soldering gun. You need a hand to hold a soldering solder. You need a hand to hold whatever you're soldering. And you need another hand to hold what you're soldering it to. You need four hands. But if we had four hands, everybody would feel sorry for us. God knows what's best for the body. And let's leave it the way he designed it. Amen? Now, here comes the clincher. Now, verse 27, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, fourth time, fourth time in this short passage, is he trying to make a point? Fourth time, God has appointed, first of all, now he's ranking them, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then, workers of miracles, then healing, then helping others, then administration, finally tongues at the bottom of the list. Then he asks the question, are all apostles? What's the obvious answer to that? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. But we are all baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. So if we're all baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ and we don't all speak in tongues, then speaking in tongues cannot be the only evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They're just wrong on that. They're wrong. In fact, I want you to follow me. If it's true, that we're all baptized by the Spirit into the body and there's no salvation apart from the body of Christ. And if it's true that baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced by speaking in tongues, then those who have not spoken in tongues would not have received the baptism and they're bold enough to tell you that. But the next step is that not only have they not received the baptism, but it's the baptism that brings us into the body of Christ so we wouldn't even be a part of the body of Christ if we haven't spoken in tongues. And to say that if you haven't given evidence by speaking in tongues, you haven't been baptized of the Spirit is the same thing as saying you are lost. And I've had people tell me as much. And that is so unchristian and so wrong. We're not saved by speaking in tongues. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, period. And the baptism of the Spirit brings us all, 
in. No matter what your gift is, helping people, licking stamps and putting them on envelopes, or preaching sermons, all of the gifts are used to build up the church, which is the body of Christ. That's Paul's theology. That's his Bible study on the gifts, and that's pretty clear, isn't it? Then comes the admonition at the end, eagerly desire the greater gifts in verse 31. So what, is the greater, what are the greater gifts? Then comes chapter 13. Do you know what chapter 13 is? It's the love chapter. In chapter 14, he applies the gifts of the Spirit. So if chapter 14, he applies it, and chapter 12, he teaches about it, why is the love chapter stuck in between the two? Because what they were doing in Corinth was not loving one another at all. They were judging and condemning and criticizing each other over the very gifts of the Spirit that were meant to promote unity instead of dividing. And so he talks about love. I don't care if you talk in the tongues of angels, he says, but if you don't have love, you're, not a, you're just a resonging gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, love one another. Then comes chapter 14. Chapter 14. Verse 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, if he's singling out any gift, it isn't tongues, it's what? Prophecy. Why does he single out prophecy? One of the reasons right here. Verse 2, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Stop, period, there we could come to the conclusion that tongues are for speaking to God. But remember, you have to ask a question. Is he describing a problem or is he prescribing a solution to the problem? Now it may sound like he's prescribing a solution. Tongues are for speaking to God. Let's read it again. Anyone who speaks in a tongue, does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Verse 3, but, that's a big word sometimes, but anyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Question. Is the purpose of the gift, even tongues, to build up the individual or to build up the church? Speaking to God in tongues may build up the individual, but it isn't going to build up the church. But prophesying when people understand is building up the church. So is Paul saying we should use the gift of tongues to talk to God? No. What he's saying is if you just talk to God in tongues and nobody understands you, if you prophesy, people understand you and you're building up the church and that's the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit, to build up the church. See, the solution is not tongues but prophecy so they can understand. Then we come to the next verse, 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Okay. So we should speak in tongues to edify ourselves. Well, we have to ask that question again. Is he describing a problem or prescribing a solution? Is he saying we should speak in tongues to edify ourselves or he, is he describing the problem in Corinth? Watch this. You decide. In verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. What's the purpose of the gifts? To edify the church to build up the church. Those who speak in tongues were building up themselves, but that's not the purpose of the gifts. But he who prophesies builds up the church. You can see where Paul's going with this, can't you? Verse 5, I would like for every one of you to speak in tongues. Oh, there it is, you see. Paul wants us all to speak in tongues. Well, that's interesting because earlier he had said we're not all to speak in tongues. So why would he be saying now, I wish you would all speak in tongues? Well, he did say, I would like to have all of you speak in tongues, but, <laughs> there it is again, but I would rather have you prophesy. Why? Because he who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless 
he interprets so that the church may be edified. And there it is again. Why did he say, I wish that you could all speak in tongues? That's what they really wanted to do. That's where they were. Paul was coming into a church that was teaching that we should all speak in tongues, we should all have this one gift, and if we didn't have it, we weren't even a part of the body. And so he's trying to meet them halfway so that he can lead them where they need to be. If he came in there and said, you guys are all wrong, you shouldn't be doing all this, why should they listen to him? Because they believed that they were doing what the Spirit was telling them to do. So he didn't. He tried to meet them halfway. He said, sure, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but I'd rather have you prophesy. It would be like me talking to you and saying, I wish that every one of you could sell your houses and buy yourself an old bus, build it into an RV, and travel around the country witnessing about Jesus Christ and being an evangelist. I wish you could all do that. But I would rather have you use the gift that God has given you. See, that's all Paul was doing. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be built up. See, the whole thing is to build up the church. So if there's an interpreter there, the church can be built up. How, why? Because they understand what's being taught. They understand what's being said. Verse 6, Now, brothers, if I come to you and I speak in tongues, what good will I be to you? unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as a flute or a harp, how will anybody know what tune is being played unless there's a distinction in the notes? If the trumpet doesn't sound a clear call, who's going to get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You'll just be speaking into the air. So what, they, what were they doing? They were making a bunch of sounds in languages that no one understood. It was just like speaking into the air. Paul says, undoubtedly there are all sorts of languages in the world, but none of them is without meaning. You see, his emphasis is on what? Meaning, understanding what's being taught. None of them was out. On the day of Pentecost, they all understood in their own language. But that's not what was happening at Corinth. It was just the opposite. They were saying a bunch of stuff and nobody understood what was being said. There's no such thing, he says, a real language without meaning. Verse 11, if then I don't grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to the speaker. So it is with you. That's what you're doing. You're speaking. Nobody understands it. They're like foreigners to you. Since you're eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that are building up the church. Tongues were not building up the church at Corinth. They did at Pentecost, not at Corinth. Something was wrong at Corinth. Verse 14. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. If I pray in a tongue, oh, I can get emotional, I can get excited, I can say amen and all these nice cool things, but I don't even know what I'm saying. My mind's unfruitful, but watch. So what do I do? Do I quit praying in the Spirit? No. I will pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my mind. I will understand what's being said. You see, God made us with understanding, and he made us with emotions and feeling. And they're both good. He put them there for a reason. I think sometimes people get so over-focused on the emotional part that they lose touch with reason. And Paul's trying to handle that. But on the other hand, there are those who are so afraid of being too emotional. Oh, we don't want to be like those holy rollers and happy clappies. <laughs> so we become the frozen chosen. <laughs> and we got it in our minds, but no emotion, scared to even say amen too loud in church. Amen. <laughs> so I think we need to be more Adventicostal. 
We need to be the happy chosen. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and excited about what we have. That's what Paul's telling me anyway. Verse 16, if you're praising God with your spirit, how can anyone who finds himself among you who doesn't understand say amen? Can't even say amen. You could be cursing the name of God for all I know. So Paul is clear. He wants people to understand. Verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. There it is. Paul spoke in tongues all over the place. Remember, tongues also means languages. He could have simply been, I speak in more languages than all of you. But, there it is again. But, verse 19, in the church I'd rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And I think it's pretty clear by now, Paul wants everyone to understand what's being said. So the church can be built up, not the individual of the church. Watch, verse 22, the so tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Tongues are not a sign for believers. No, they're a sign for unbelievers. That's what happened with Peter at Cornelius' house when the unbelieving Gentiles started speaking in tongues. It was a sign for them that they were accepted by the Holy Spirit. Tongues are a sign for unbelievers, not believers. Watch this one, verse 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who don't understand or some unbeliever comes in, will they not say, you're out of your mind? Oh, you guys are nuts, man. I'm out of here. That's what Paul said. So what shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. He didn't say, I want you to quit all that stuff. Listen to this. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. All of them. They must be done to strengthen the church. Not you, but the church. Verse 27 then, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Because, verse 33, God is a God of order, not of disorder, a God of peace. When you come together, everyone is blabbing in tongues. One at a time. Two. At the most. Three. No more. And there has to be an interpreter there. Somebody asked me, how am I going to know if there's an interpreter there? I, said, I don't know. He doesn't say here. He just says, be sure there's one there. And if there's not, then don't do it. Be quiet. Now, can you see that when Paul says one at, they were all doing it at once, and he says one at a time. Two, never more than three, and you have to have an interpreter. Can you see that Paul is controlling that manifestation of the Spirit in Corinth? Absolutely. He's controlling. He's squelching it. They were all wanting to do it, and he said, no, no, just three at the most, one at a time. He was squelching what was happening at Corinth. Now, you tell me, would Paul squelch a genuine manifestation of the Holy Spirit? Would Paul say, Holy Spirit, you're going too fast at Corinth. You need to slow down a little bit. I don't think so. So what was he doing? Well, some of you may want me to say, well, they were all demon-possessed and he was calling them a bunch of demons. No, he didn't do that. He didn't say you're all demon-possessed. They were Christians. He called them saints at the beginning of the letter. He says, you're saints. They were confused, but they were saints. He didn't say you're demon-possessed. Well, then what else could have been happening there? Notice it was all going on at one time. Exciting music, speaking in tongues, prophesying, all of this stuff going on at one time. The church was teaching that everybody needed to speak in tongues. Now, if you were a member of that church and you had not yet started speaking in tongues, what would you want more than anything else? You would want that special gift 
that special blessing that you're being taught everyone should have. In fact, you're not even a part of the body of Christ till you get it. So here you are in this exciting, supercharged, emotional environment, striving to speak in tongues, and suddenly they tell us it's possible to induce in that environment a trance-like type of existence that causes people to come up with something that sounds like tongues when it's really not. Almost like self-hypnosis. And I have had people tell me, you know, Pastor, I've always wondered if I was, if God was doing that, if it was just me on my own. That's what I think was happening at Corinth. One at a time, two at the most, three must be an interpreter. He's taking away that intense, supercharged environment, and he knew that it would just die out. He didn't go and say, brothers, yours is genuine, and brother over here, yours is false. No, he didn't do that. They were Christians. He took away that environment, and he knew that soon it would just die out. One at a time, two at the most three, there has to be an interpretation. If not, just be quiet in church. And I think we could learn a lesson from Paul. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. One of the questions I always like to ask when people ask me, why don't we speak in tongues? The question I like to ask, and you don't have to say amen for this one. I don't want you to get embarrassed. The question I like to ask is, well, if the purpose of the baptism of the Spirit and speaking in tongues is to build up the church throughout the whole world, and the American Bible Society, not sponsored by our church, did an independent study and showed that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is preaching the gospel in more countries than all of the other Protestant churches put together. Now, if we are preaching in more countries than all the other Pro Protestant churches put together, including yours, and you have the baptism of the Spirit, and we don't, then what are you doing with it? See, that's my question. What are you doing with it? And don't say amen if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, because my next question is for you. What are you doing with it? How many people have you talked to about Jesus Christ? How many people have you led to follow the Lamb? 